My name is Peter Maberduke. I'm the Access to Medicines Director at Public Citizen. So excited to be here with you this week and truly privileged to introduce our next speaker. You know, the adage goes that if the, uh, if the people lead, the leaders will follow, as our last panel discussed. However, on occasion, we are so fortunate as to have leaders who truly lead. And we have several of them here with us this week. Uh, the first of several elected officials, members of Congress to speak, the inimitable Congressman Lloyd Doggett is here today. Please give him a round of applause. <clears throat> as a senior member, as a senior member on the House Ways and Means Committee, Congressman Lloyd Doggett is a ranking member on the Tax Policy Subcommittee and also serves on the Subcommittee on Trade and Human Resources as well as the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. Prior to, to coming to Congress, he served as a justice on the Texas Supreme Court and as a Texas state senator. He has been a leading advocate for Medicare drug price negotiations since before Medicare Part D was enacted. AARP has twice honored him with its Legislative Leadership Award for his efforts to preserve seniors' access to health care. Uh, ten times, readers of the Austin Chronicle have recognized his work with Best of Austin Awards. That sounds like a pretty awesome uh, honorific. And Save the Children named him a congressional champion for real and lasting change. Since founding the House Affordable Prescription Drug Task Force in 2015, he has been a vocal advocate against prescription tr price gouging and has introduced several times or several pieces of legislation to rein in wrongdoing. Uh, to rein in wrongdoing and continues to push Congress and the administration to hold Big Pharma accountable for soaring costs. Please welcome Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. Do I need that or will this cover? Let's, let's give it okay. to Okay, great. How really inspiring it is to see so many of you here committed to uh, correcting many of the injustices that surround us, particularly in the health field. Uh, you know, I can't turn on uh, the news on television without seeing a pharmaceutical ad. Uh, they urge me to ask my doctor for a prescription, even if I haven't been diagnosed for the condition. <laughs> and uh, they're such happy ads. Uh, you know, one of them is uh, uh, takes place at a bridge that's my favorite cycling cross bridge uh, in Austin uh, uh, on a beautiful spot. Uh, and they're so happy that you almost don't hear the warnings and disclaimers that come along that if you take this medication, you risk death and many other conditions that are worse than the disease that they're treating. Uh, I think every Trump tweet or comment ought to come along with such a disclaimer, uh, especially those in this area which uh, could have a uh, no action expected or no action undertaken to go along with the tweet. Uh, the, the cost of prescription drugs we know is soaring at the brand name ones at 10 times the rate of inflation. Uh, and American families certainly need action, not tweets. You never hear a family physician <coughs> tell her patient, take two tweets and call me in the morning. But that's about all that Trump and his administration have been offering us. After his big uh, Rose Garden announcement uh, a few weeks back, uh, I'm still searching for rose-colored lenses thick enough uh, to find anything in there that might bring down prices. In fact, prices were supposed to come down by now, but for some reason, they've only gone up. Uh, even as Trump is indifferent to taking terrified toddlers away from their mother's arms, neither has he produced a plan to unify or reunify patients with drugs that they can afford. Unfortunately, we just don't have a miracle cure for prescription price gouging. Even without a cure all, you would expect at least a cure some, but it's not coming from this administration. That is why a few years back, I uh, formed the Prescription Drug Task Force to try to come up with some answers uh, to expose what's happening, as many of you have done through your organizations, and to confront Big Pharma in the harm that it is causing our country and the failure of people in both parties to raise this issue up where it needs to be, up where the American people have already placed it. We know that despite his strong comments during the campaign, President Trump has populated his administration with people 
who, while he was campaigning, were out in the executive suites helping to spike the very drug prices that we're here about today. The communications that I get uh, when I'm back in Texas and, and through the email are really just heartbreaking. I think of uh, Elaine, who has glaucoma, who told me that it is difficult to have dignity in her retirement when, despite the insurance coverage she has, it's $815 every month just to try to preserve her eyesight. I think of Joy Jean in Austin, who's experiencing difficulties at fording an EpiPen uh, for her 12-year-old. Before the Affordable Care Act, she could not even get coverage because of the autoimmune deficiency that her daughter has. And now she's paying about $1,200 a year, even after the coupons, to assure that there's an EpiPen available wherever uh, her daughter is. And of course, Republicans are now trying to drag us back to the good old days when insurance monopolies could put into the fine pen of their policies exclusions for all kinds of pre-existing conditions and limitations on what an insurance policy covers. Unfortunately, the Trump administration and too much of this Congress stand with Big Pharma. They don't stand with Elaine or Joy Jean or other people around the country. Pharma gets the best legislation that it can buy, and it buys a lot. Drug makers spent over $171 million last year, exceeding oil and gas, exceeding insurance, exceeding just about any other industry in their influence peddling down the street and through the administrative agencies here. They have 882 lobbyists. That's more than two, almost, it's about two to one for the members of Congress. Uh, and that form of money is about inaction, it's about delay, it's about misleading, it's about dithering and procrastination, and we have had plenty of that. Just last Thursday, Republicans objected, rejected in the committee on which I serve Ways and Means just doing a study that would come out next year about the benefits of Medicare price negotiation. It's a little like climate change. They don't want too much study. They might learn something. The facts are just, well, the facts seem to me to regularly have a Democratic bias on most issues, and they don't want that. We aren't here, of course, just to complain, to commiserate, or to agonize about this. We're here to organize, and so many of you bring strong organizing skills to this conference. As we prepare for the midterms, we need to look at every candidate. We need to turn to open secrets, as I do when I'm looking for co-sponsors for some of these proposals, and say, how much money did this candidate, did this elected official take from the pharmaceutical industry, and when? And be assured that big pharma generosity, as your panel just pointed out, uh, it doesn't discriminate. It has plenty of Democrats that it contributes to, as well as Republicans. Determine whether these candidates are speaking from their heart about this problem, are from their pocket. Uh, I believe that the only way that we will change these laws is to change the lawmakers. Yeah. And that needs to be the focus. It's, it's, not, it's not just about being social. Uh, it's not just about social media. It is about being social and going out and building coalitions. And it's a recognition uh, that too many of uh, the elected officials, as you well know, at all levels of government, say one thing like Trump and then end up not doing anything on this critical issue. Uh, our marches, our protests, our banners, our tweet storms, they're all important. But if we don't focus that energy into changing individual lawmakers who are unresponsive and build a coalition of elected officials here and at the state level to address this problem, Pharma will get away with what President Trump called murder uh, as they, uh, they'll continue to do that. And as your panel also just noted, uh, Pharma is great with its generosity to all of the various nonprofit groups that care about individual diseases. You know, many of these groups are very well intentioned. They need funds to operate and get the message out to other victims of a disease. They welcome somebody who might have the expertise on a local board or a national board from working as a pharma executive, uh, and they get co-opted. One of the rare exceptions is the National Multiple, Multiple Sclerosis Society, which has spoken out on this. But we need to recognize that, 
And as we visit with those groups, when I go out to some of them to their various fundraisers, I find plenty of individuals there who have experienced the effect of price gouging, but sometimes the leadership of the groups are, are, are not willing to speak out. And I think, as many of you know, there are great opportunities at the state and local level. In this terribly troubling time of Trump, it is time for states, and in regressive states like the state of Texas, our city governments, to be the real laboratories of democracy and help us build the ideas and the concepts which some states are doing to tackle this and other health care problems. So while little progress is being made legislatively, there are a number of legislative proposals out there that I'll just touch on very briefly. One of them, as you know, has the backing of 92% of Americans concerning recent surveys. It's hard to get 92% of Americans to agree on anything. But that's the basic concept of let's negotiate prices. Let's do for those who rely on Medicare what we already do for our veterans. And President Trump said it very well not long ago when he said, quote, they don't bid them out. They say like $300 billion could be saved if we bid them out. We don't do it. Why? Because of the drug companies. And Trump's right on both the what and the why. But whether it's Big Pharma or the National Rifle Association, he seems to take delight in criticizing legislators for yielding to this lobby power and then doing the same thing himself. Mm -hmm. uh, with the invaluable leadership that Public Citizen has provided, I hope to introduce in the near future a new form of Medicare prescription price gouging legislation that will allow us to negotiate, to use competitive licensing as an, a, a way to address the, the problem of price gouging so that if negotiations fail, uh, we would have authority to have competitive licensing to allow other manufacturers to come in and produce the same drug and encourage some competition. It cannot be all carrot. We have to have a stick here also. Clearly, transparency is an issue that's critical here. We need price, tra uh, price transparency to understand where's our money going and what drug costs, why do they keep rising when there's so little change in manufacturing cost or product utility. All we see is more and more money spent on advertising <coughs> and not an increase in research and development. Uh, the nine out of the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies spend more on marketing than they do on research. And the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies, as you may know, were one of the greatest beneficiaries of the Trump tax sham, the, the tax bill that passed through here. They got about $80 billion out of that Republican tax bill. Where's the decrease in price? Where is the increase in uh, research and development to find cures to all those diseases I want them to cure before I get them? You know, uh, we don't see it. We do see plenty of stock buybacks, but we don't see the commitment uh, that is necessary. And of course, uh, at his big Rose Garden speech, Trump took a new turn, uh, actually not so new, but it's what he turns to in demonizing foreigners whenever there's a problem. He said, uh, you know, the problem is not that we're paying too much, it's the other countries they're paying too little. Because those other countries have great deal makers that can cut the deals that Trump told us he could cut to get lower prices and anyone who thinks that this bizarre trickle-down theory that if people pay less for prescriptions in Germany or in Japan, that somehow people in South Texas will pay less, well, they need more than a prescription. <laughs> On Friday, you'll hear from a number of experts about what's happening around the globe. We need to learn from our neighbors in the industrial country about the failures of our officials as well as the successes of some of theirs. Another big issue that I've been involved in is this whole problem of the taxpayers paying for the research but not getting the benefits of that research. I'm pleased you have a panel on that. Again and again, the National Institutes of Health has refused to set standards to take action, which it could under existing law, to uh, try to get affordable drugs when it's the taxpayer who paid for the research that led to that drug. The opioid crisis, we passed uh, legislation, umpteen bills through the Congress recently that are great window dressing, but will do very little to bring new treatment or new access to prescription drugs 
uh, for folks. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry, some parts of it helped create the opioid crisis. And now other parts of it, particularly those who spiked the price of naloxin uh, by about 700 percent, they're part of the problem. But again, and there was an unwillingness to stand up to big pharma on any aspect of this. I know you're going to explore in some of the breakout sessions the whole hepatitis C issue and the fact that it is nearly bankrupting some governmental entities in being able to provide uh, the drugs that are necessary and in other cases people who need access to those life-saving drugs cannot get them because of the cost. Even the state of Louisiana has urged the use of existing law to get more access to uh, hepatitis drugs and to look at how we can get more competition in this area. In my uh, congressional district that runs from San Antonio to Austin, uh, as with many other parts of the country, diabetes is almost at epidemic proportions. And to see insulin, which has been around for so long, increase in its price so much when the uh, CDC estimates that 30 million Americans have diabetes is just flat wrong. And I know you have a group that will focus on that. Progress in Washington in standing up to pharma is practically non-existent. But we have seen some progress in big pharma's attitude. And it's been rather remarkable right up through yesterday. Three years ago, as we got our prescription drug task force underway, all the pharma ads up here were, no problem. It's no big deal. Pharmaceutical prices, they uh, are a small component of health care generally, and they aren't up uh, that much more than anything else. And then last year, the attitude changed in the ads. The ads were, yes, there's a problem. It's someone else's problem. Uh, we didn't cause it. They began their finger pointing. It's somebody else in the distribution chain. And the most recent uh, ones are, Yes, there's a problem. There are a series of ads you may see in some of our Capitol Hill publications about how they sympathize with the problem seniors are having, and they're going to be there to help solve the problem. Well, uh, we saw remarkable testimony this week from Secretary Azar, recently of the pharmaceutical suites uh, entrusted with the agenda, and he told the Senate recently the pharmaceutical companies want to lower prices just like we asked, but they just can't do it because of the way things are set up. Well, all that is nonsense, and your job as activists is to help us expose the nonsense. We need to be the voice for the people who are dealing with illness, uh, with life-threatening conditions, and speak up for them. Uh, this is the conclusion of my speech, and it is the shortest part. It's the part about the good news. <laughs> what is the good news in all this? I think you're that good news. You, the activist, who can light a spark under elected officials and can organize many of the families that have endured this, can engage everyone, the impacted office holders on the local level who are having to come up with ways to pay the bill for ever-rising health care costs, the physicians, the hospitals, some of the small businesses that are involved here, our veterans that see the benefit of price negotiation and have family members who can't get those drugs. This afternoon, you'll hear from even more advocates on building an inclusive movement. I hope that each of you will bring your experiences to bear so that we can learn from one another about building a stronger coalition. We need to be strong. Frustration is a word that is banned from my office. We don't have the luxury of being frustrated. There are too many people out there that need our involvement. And so I invite your participation. Uh, Afton uh, from my office uh, will be on one of the panels tomorrow. We're going to drop off to go along with your materials, uh, some other materials that might be used in helping some of the people who are seeking office at all levels raise this issue in town halls and other ways. Let's not take no for an answer when it comes to standing up to big pharma. Uh, we need to be well informed. We need to be inclusive. We need to be unceasing in our demands for change. We need to never give up and never give in. Thank you for being here and what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.